to the uh, Chicago Council on Science and Technology program on high-speed rail, high-speed rail generally, high-speed rail in the, in the Midwest. I'm Al Shreesheim. I am the president of the Chicago Council on Science and Technology, the former director of Argonne National Laboratory, and uh, as I say, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the evening on high-speed rail. A little bit of an introduction. I don't know if you need much. The um, issue of our infrastructure in, in the country, in the Midwest and in the country, is, of course, a major concern, or should be a major concern. Uh, the, uh, the rail system, the road system, uh, that whole infrastructure issue and uh, the issue of high-speed rail and how to maximize the efficiency of transportation is, uh, is, has got an interesting combination of technology and public policy and financing and all of those play against one another. All one has to do if you do some traveling overseas you see the rail systems in Europe, the rail systems in Asia, and then compare a number of those with our systems to realize that there is something that uh, we should be done in our country in an area that we certainly had led for many years and uh, up until now. So I look forward to the evening. We'll. Uh, address the high-speed rail part of the overall transportation system and of course with particular focus on the Midwest some of the engineering and technology challenges and the recent progress that uh, both near and uh, longer term what the long-term wishes and plans are uh, for Midwest and high-speed rail service. Now, before we I introduce the uh, the speakers, the, in you undoubtedly picked up a, a packet of material from the Chicago Council on Science and Technology. It uh, provides an insight into what programs are coming up in our fall season and I encourage you to look at those and if you can make it you should come. Also in the packet is a uh, card so that uh, you could sign up to become a member of the Chicago Council on Science and Technology. We are a membership organization and I encourage you if you have an interest in the issues of science and technology, public policy, uh, the, the whole critical getting your information from people who actually know something about the subject rather than from the recent latest that you get in, uh, in the newspapers which may or may not be accurate. And I also encourage you to fill out a card that uh, gives an evaluation of the program of the evening and uh, what, it, what programs you would like to see the Chicago Council concentrate on. So with that, I would uh, like to introduce our first speaker. We have a panel, uh, speakers of, we have three speakers, we also have two representatives of the Illinois Department of Transportation, I'm glad to see, and one of them will come up at, at the end, sit with our panel. So our first speaker is Dr. Hani, uh, Hani S. Manasani, who holds the William Patterson Distinguished Chair of Transportation at Northwestern University, where he is the director of the Transportation Center, professor of civil environmental engineering, McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, and a professor in the management and decision sources at Kellogg School of Management. 
I'm not, he, he has a number of publications. I'm not going to go through and read them all. And uh, it is a pleasure uh, to have uh, Dr. Hani Manasami come and lead us off. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here with you today and um, thank the uh, council for the invitation um, to uh, speak and share with you um, some of our um, thoughts and, and, and impressions about high-speed rail and the issues that um, surround its, um, its development um, in the U.S. as well as um, you know, particular focus on the on, on the Midwest. Okay, so um, high-speed rail has been um, kind of uh, stimulating the imagination of many of us. Um, many of us who who, who 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 enjoy our mobility and uh, who uh, enjoy being able to get from point A to point B with a certain um, level uh, of, of of service and convenience. And um, in, in my talk today, I'm going to give you more of a user perspective on high-speed rail and uh, what, the, what, what a, a network of high-speed services might entail. Then we'll place it in the context of, uh, a, you know, the broader context of mobility in the region and uh, the role that high-speed rail might, might play uh, in, in the regional um, and, uh, and national context. Uh, the... Uh, <coughs> So we're going to take a, a the, you know approach the problem uh, first from uh, the, the perspective of what users are interested in. You know, over the years and over history, um, mankind has has been driven by a desire for speed, if you wish. People prefer faster modes to uh, slower ones, and uh, that, of course, will expands the opportunity to uh, to to. Um, the opportunities available to us by expanding the region that can be reached within a certain time budget. Essentially, it al allows us to consume space at a, at a faster rate, if you wish. And uh, if you look, again, over, over our, our modern history, starting with the sort of the westward migration from Mediterranean old world to uh, Europe, then to uh, you know, East Coast, Midwest, West Coast, and so on, you will find that, that increasingly these developments have taken advantage of faster and faster modes, allowing people to, to, to cover greater distances, and as I said, to, to consume uh, space essentially, uh, in, in, in more space in, in less time. And so if you then look at the, at the range that you could access, um, at auto speeds, um, you know, using our freeway system uh, versus um, 220 mile per hour max speed uh, high speed rail, you, you can see the considerable um, expansion of, of, of the realm that can be reached within one, two, three, and so on uh, hours. Okay. In addition, though, to 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 speed, uh, that is, our desire to get from A to B in less time, we also want reliability. People prefer more reliable modes to unreliable ones. It seems obvious, it is. But, uh, you know, behavior studies reveal that people value one minute reduction in the standard deviation, that is in the variability of travel time, from about 30 to 50% more than they do a one minute reduction in the average travel time. So reliability is very important to us, and the, the ability to, to, to complete our trip in a predictable uh, amount of time is extremely important to us. Also, what travel behavior uh, scientists have learned is that time is not homogeneous. You know, people dislike waiting time more than they dislike, say, time in transit. And so what happens at nodes, not just along links, is integral to the travel experience. And again, behavior studies reveal that people value a one minute reduction in waiting time from about three to five times more than a one minute reduction in the in-vehicle travel time. And that, of course, has implications for then the desirable kind of uh, you know, services that one is, um, is providing. 
Also, we're, we're increasingly learning that time used productively for work or leisure is valued more highly than dead time, time where we're not doing uh, or seemingly doing anything. Of course, if we're relaxing or sleeping, that is also productive uh, but as opposed to, to, to time that is, you know, that, 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 is, uh, uh, that one feels uh, is, is being wasted. And in this regard, new technologies are really playing a, an important part. And so connectivity in transit, for instance, becomes critical in improving the user's perceived value. Uh, and so when you put these things together, user preferences are fairly clear. And the question becomes, how do you deliver longer distances in less time, reliably, and with a travel environment that is conducive to the productive use of time? of course, at competitive cost. And so then, with that in mind, what is the role and niche of high-speed rail in the regional travel picture, and where can it, where can it deliver? You know, so to the extent that we want predictable travel times and we want, you know, at, at, and high speeds, clearly a dedicated right-of-way uh, allows us to have that kind of reliability. And a right-of-way that is on the ground is going to give us more reliability than one that is subject, say, to, to more you know, weather delays at O'Hare and so on. And, and so, so there's clearly, uh, again, a, an argument from a user perspective standpoint to deliver, uh, you know, for high-speed rail, to deliver both you know, high speeds with reliability and providing users with, 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 a, with, a, with, a, with a convenient and, and productive uh, environment. So the, the federal vision for, for a high-speed rail is one of a hierarchy of services with tiered passenger rail corridors from core express corridors that connect urban areas up to 500 miles apart within two to three hours travel time at, at speeds that range from 125 to 250 miles per hour requiring electrified and dedicated track to regional corridors that connect mid-sized urban areas at lower speeds than, than the, you know, the core areas. There you may have either dedicated and or shared track or a combination of both. Then to, to sort of emerging or feeder routes connecting regional urban areas, smaller areas to, to, to the larger ones with speeds up to 90 miles per hour, primarily along shared track and shared with uh, mostly with, with either um, um, uh, sort of commuter type services and or with, with, with freight services. And so that's been kind of driving the, the, the federal vision there. And uh, within that, of course, we're all aware of the, 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 the ongoing investments uh, to the sort of the down payment on that program that the federal government has, uh, you know, has uh, initiated. And uh, you could see there the, in red the core areas and then in yellow these regional uh, lines. And if you look at the Midwest, of course, you see primarily regional lines. You don't see core express lines as part of the federal program, meaning that primarily one is looking at a uh, service with maximum speed of about 110 miles per hour. Okay. Now, the Midwest Regional Rail Initiative, the initial plan that, that, was, you know, that, that has been followed there, and the source there is, is an IDOT presentation as of April uh, um, 2011, shows these types of these services from the regional high-speed rail up to 110 miles per hour to uh, you know the, the, the next level and then finally to, to, to those uh, em emerging lines and again the, the core spines there are, are, are the, uh, the, the the blue lines that you see there but that has been since modified with the vision presented by Governor Quinn in June where he announced a study uh, that that the University of uh, um, of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign is conducting, and my colleague Chris Barkin, who will be speaking next, is leading that study to examine the feasibility of 220 miles per hour, or, or, or very high-speed rail, if you wish, between Chicago and Champaign. Now, you may not think of Champaign necessarily as being this major urban area that is, you know, one absolutely needs to connect to Chicago at 220 miles per hour, but it, uh, you know, there are maybe other network-related reasons where that, may, that may justify that, and again, uh, my colleague who's conducting the study will have more to say about that. Now, the Midwest High-Speed Rail Association has taken that vision and said, 
we, need, we really need very high speed rail here. We should go for 220 miles per hour services. And so instead of those blue lines that we had there, let's make them purple and get uh, so-called bullet trains with maximum speed of about 220 miles per hour. And then the, um, uh, the orange lines here become regional lines and then uh, conventional rail being shown in blue. And that, this would then allow you to get to Minneapolis-St. Paul from Chicago in, in two hours and 40 minutes. Uh, essentially, within three hours of Chicago, you, you have a range of about 500, um, 500 miles with, with, the, with the very high speed services. Okay. Now, a commonly invoked analogy for why high speed rail would work in the Midwest is the Midwest versus France. And, uh, and this is a comparison here of these of the networks um, hub, uh, hubbed in, in, um, in Chicago versus Paris, and um, essentially uh, showing you that a Midwest rail system would serve the same number of people as the current French system centered on Paris. Of course, that also goes to, uh, to London eventually, Brussels, and so on. And uh, that it would connect, in this case, five regions whoops, with five regions with um, <clears throat> over two million residents uh, whereas the French system only connects two such regions now you can compare the uh, the, the, the densities uh, uh, the, of of that region, and depending on what you include and what you do not include, you come up with different numbers. But um, a um, comparison uh, here um, that is was compiled um, by um, on, on one of the websites, in fact, with using um, <coughs> sources from the uh, World Factbook, the U.S. Census Bureau, and so on, shows you a. a, 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 a population density per square mile in the Midwest that is in fact rather comparable to France and Northern, uh, Northern California and in fact even somewhat higher than Spain and of course both Spain and France are, are considered very successful examples of, uh, of high speed rail services. With that perspective, then Japan and the Northeast Corridor have comparable, uh, comparable densities. All this to, to, to say that from a density perspective, which has been generally the sort of a negative argument against high-speed rail, in the sense that, well, the US doesn't quite have the densities. You know, if you define your areas suitably, uh, ultimately you, you, you get rather comparable densities in that sense. And if you, uh, and this is a slide from, uh, from Alstom, um, that, that where, uh, again, the, you identify in the U.S. corridors that are somewhat comparable to the uh, Paris, um, Lyon, um, uh, or the French, uh, the French system. Okay. So um, if you look at what is going on in terms of high-speed rail around the world, it clearly has become a, um, essentially the intercity uh, mode of choice in many ways. And uh, as more countries are joining the economically uh, developed or advanced rank, you're, you're finding them investing, you're finding that they are investing in high-speed rail networks. So from the initial uh, sort of pioneering roles of France, uh, Japan, and, 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 and Germany, mo most or many countries in Europe today have some sort of high-speed rail services, and you could see, in fact, that there's been uh, an, an increase of over 100% um, in the last 10 years in terms of high-speed rail ridership in Europe. And if you look at the, uh, again, the projected growth in the years to come, again, you, you could, you know, that trend is certainly continuing. And uh, if you look at what is, you know, as of April uh, 2010, of where the high-speed rail has, has, you know, has, has, been, um, has been built and developed, uh, again, from the original investments in France and Japan uh, and, and Germany, you know, then you, you get Spain um, and um, some uh, developments in, uh, in a few other places in, the, uh, in, in Europe, but then you get the, the newer investments uh, in places like Taiwan and China and the massive plan, of course, that the Chinese have committed to, um, as well as the investment that is, the commitment that has been made in, in Italy and the expansion planned in Spain. In addition to this list, though, 
you will find that uh, countries like Saudi Arabia are, are investing in high-speed rail. The United Arab Emirates, uh, Turkey is also uh, investing in, in high-speed rail. Russia, Brazil, and, 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 and so on. And it will not be long before we have more you know, de development in India and so on. So it's, not, it's no longer a, a viewed as an esoteric or a luxury mode, but it really is viewed as the mode for intercity travel within a certain, within a certain range. Okay? And if, if you look at the uh, top and average speeds of world high-speed lines, and uh, what is proposed by the Midwest High-Speed Rail um, uh, Association is comparable to what is also proposed for the uh, for the for the northeast uh, mega re mega region, and that's comparable to the top speeds that we're uh, are we're, we're getting in, in China today, and that the TGV in France is, is is pushing for, and so on. Of course, you also see this discrepancies between the maximum speed and the average speeds, because of course uh, trains have to accelerate, decelerate. You have to go slower in certain sections, and so on. So where is the sweet spot for high-speed rail? If you look at a curve here of the rail-to-air modal split, and in fact, you know, rail competes on one level with, with auto for some of the shorter distances, and another level with, with air for the longer, longer distances. If you look at the mode split for, uh, for air versus rail, um, this here shows you in different cities of the world the percentage, uh, the modal share of high-speed rail versus, versus plane. And um, you know, you look at places like uh, Paris, Lyon, or Paris, Brussels. There is very little remaining air service between these areas. Most people who, in fact, fly tend to be connecting because they bought a ticket all the way to their destination and find that they are connecting in, um, um, at, you know, at, 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 in, at Charles de Gaulle or other airports. But in fact, if often. If you, if you buy a, a, a ticket, an air ticket to, to, to Lyon via Paris, the last leg has a, an, perhaps an American Airlines uh, flight number, but it's really uh, SNCF, you're, you're actually going on a train, and that is by far the most practical mode to get from, from Paris to, 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 to Lyon, and it, and it beats an, any sort of air travel experience between these two cities, similarly to Brussels and other places. And so you could see here uh, a very high mode share for high-speed rail, up to uh, about a, a, a travel time here of two and a half to three hours. Beyond that, it's still pretty significant, but it starts dropping to in, you know till about four four and a half um, hours. Okay. So clearly, you know the connection between distance and time here is is is, is important, and this is where the, the the top speed comes into play in terms of the 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 uh, range where uh, high speed rail is going to be um, highly competitive. And here's a, a curve um, from uh, a study that was done by, at the Penn Design School at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, this is um, the distance, and this is time here, and the. This, if you take conventional rail, okay, this is uh, you know, how long it takes you to traverse a certain distance. This is simplified using straight lines, just to, uh, to, 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 to make the point here. Uh, you could see that essentially um, rail is going to be competitive uh, in a relative, well, well up to about uh, 200, 200 miles. Auto is competitive with, is better than rail up to about 100 or 150, and then, of course, beyond about 250 or so, rail air is going to take over. With high-speed rail, the, at the top speeds, uh, this, the, the picture changes, and now you have this entire range where high-speed rail is, in fact, the mode of choice from a user perspective. Okay. Now, from a cost standpoint, and this is in terms of the fare charged, uh, here's an interesting comparison looking at what is charged currently in by the Acela service, that's the higher speed service in the Northeast Corridor, versus uh, of various services per kilometer as well as per um, average uh, kilometer per hour, that is per, per unit of speed, if you wish. And you can see that the pricing in the Northeast Corridor is relatively um, higher than it is internationally, but at the same time, it's still quite competitive with, with air and other modes in that corridor. 
So from a user perspective then, where high-speed rail is best, the range ends up being from about 100 to 450 miles with up to three hours of travel time. Beyond 500 miles, clearly air dominates in the 350 to 500 mile zone. That will then depend on the terminal connections, access time, etc. Now, from a social cost perspective, of course, rail has known advantages there. It by far beats the competition in terms of energy cost per, um, per passenger kilometer. This is a petroleum equivalent gram that has been uh, computed by the uh, French uh, National Railways, SNCF, uh, per, passenger uh, per passenger kilometer. Again, comparing air to um, auto buses, conventional rail to, uh, to the TGV or, or very high-speed rail system. And uh, another picture, again, show, illustrating the, the, uh, the um, uh, energy efficiency for passenger travel of high-speed rail relative to of very high speed to rapid commuter rail and so on. Uh, down to airplanes, which of course are um, less, uh, much less efficient uh, per, uh, per passenger kilometer. Safety, of course, is also a pretty, pretty good, you can't beat zero really in terms of, uh, of fatali fatalities. Uh, this is per billion passenger kilometers. Of course, unfortunately, this is before the recent China accident, which has somewhat changed the, the, you know, the, the perception of high-speed rail, but, uh, you know, there are, again, we've had many, many years of, of, of operational experience, France, Germany, and many other places with, with, with a near-perfect uh, safety record. So what's the estimated price tag for that? Uh, the, in the study that the Mid Midwest High Speed Rail um, Association had commissioned that ACOM had conducted, uh, again, building the costs on a component by component basis, the total price tag for the, the, the again, the very high speed spine that is being proposed for of about 1430 miles, uh, including some route overlap, is about $75 billion, this is construction cost, in 2010 uh, dollars for the 150 mile per hour uh, system versus about 83.6, 84 billion for the 220 miles per hour system. If you convert that to cost per mile, it's about 52 billion to 58 billion, a relatively, relatively small difference, they argue, uh, given the, the increased accessibility and the quality of service that you would expect at that level. But just to place that in perspective, here is a, uh, um, here's a comparison of the cost per mile. This is an estimate that California has come up with that is now being, being criticized by, because as being too low versus uh, so the international experience uh, for on a, on a per mile basis. This is in, in, in million dollars per, uh, per million US dollars uh, per, per, per mile. And the estimates, again, that, uh, that were obtained in that study fit right in up towards the, the lower end uh, of the spectrum. Now, caveats, and I'm gonna go get, get to that in a second. Initial estimates always are biased on the low side, and the ex experience is very clear with that, but, but let's, let's kind of look, look at these. Well, some areas of concern here. The first area is one that my, my uh, colleague uh, Chris Barkin will be talking more about. is that of shared operation with, with freight services. And um, we had done a study uh, a few years back for the European Commission looking at um, a, a somewhat different problem where, where we, were, we wanted to run freight services on a passenger network. And we developed a state-of-the-art network simulation assignment platform that integrated demand models and supply models in, in a dynamic analysis framework and examined a network that spanned 23 countries in primarily Eastern Europe and uh, compared what would happen if we went from the current scheduling of freight services at night only so as not to interfere with passenger service to one where additional uh, daytime operations are allowed still respecting strict priority for passenger trains. Of course, in the US, the picture is exactly the opposite because in the US, freight pays the bill, okay? Freight, you know, freight railroads own the track and freight pays the bill for, 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 um, for that track, essentially, and passenger services are uh, subsidized, uh, essentially, uh, over, that, over that shared track. And so uh, the, the allocation 
follows different, uh, dif different um, principles. But when we did that and allowed a little bit of flexibility in scheduling, we found that the potential to increase the freight flows by about 15%. And similarly, one can then conduct studies to examine scheduling schemes and what the implications would be for both freight and passengers. Okay? So, again, without wanting to, to go on to, to, to the, the, the next topic, but at some level, at some level, shared operation becomes incompatible with very high-speed operation without very significant investment. Um, as I said, freight, freight owns the track and pays the bill in, in, in the U.S., and in, in, in many uh, locations, the freight system is nearing capacity and has serious bottlenecks, especially around the Chicago area, and the CREATE program will partially alleviate some of that, but we have to keep that in mind in that discussion. And so separate track is desirable and in the long run inevitable if very high speed rail is to develop. There are some encouraging models of profitable private operation. For example, in Italy. Uh, Italy is going with multiple operators of high-speed rail on track, though, that is owned by, by, by public agencies, with, but with, you know, so without infrastructure cost burden. And the North, Northeast Mega Region High Speed Rail has put forward some very interesting models for public private approaches for the financing and operation of high speed rail in, in the Northeast. And uh, the other thing is that when you have multiple services on shared infrastructure, that will require advanced collaborative decision making, uh, management framework, and operational processes, which will keep us as researchers busy for, for some time. Um, the big caveat is that construction cost estimates are notoriously unreliable, not only for rail, but for large transportation projects. The big dig in Boston, perfect example. Okay? So you can expect about 30% increase as you go from planning stage to engineering. You know, once you start looking at the routing, et cetera, what you have to avoid, what you have to bypass, the cost as estimates go up by about 30%. And another 50 to 100% increase in actual inc incurred costs. Not only for rail, highways, you name it. Anytime you're dealing particularly with urban environments, that's gonna be the case. Now, all passenger and most freight modes will entail some form of public investment subsidy in different forms, you may call it differently, it could be user fees of one kind or another, but a public role in that space is, is essential. And uh, the last point is the demand aspect. If we build it, will they come? Demand factors, I started out with those. Higher speed reliability, productive environment are all very positive factors on the demand side. The convenience, though, is still important, and that depends on the connectivity to other modes, especially air, and accessibility at destinations. Station design and town centers cannot be underemphasized there. The longer term, second order effects on economic activity are likely, though the magnitude is uncertain, but definitely there will be some impact, generally positive. And the total demand will then be a combination of that diverted demand from other modes and the induced demand that is created in part by economic activity enabled by high-speed rail. But the big caveat is that demand forecasts are subject to considerable uncertainty. That's the state of the art and the state of the practice. It's uncertainty in external inputs, the economy, land use, social preferences, and so on, in models and parameters, and in the methods that are used by our community to elicit user preferences for measurement. For instance, we like to use revealed preferences, what people are doing today. But that's not possible for new modes that don't exist already. So we use stated preferences where we just ask people, if, we, you, know, if you had these options, what would you do? And that could be unreliable. And uh, currently, probably the, the, uh, the sort of state of the art in that is the ongoing California high-speed rail study with, with, with rigorous external peer review. It's, a, again, a good uh, example of how to proceed with such studies. So in conclusion, high-speed rail has a definite role to play in enhancing regional mobility, increasing connectivity, and economic social opportunity in the Midwest mega region. There are plausible scenarios for economically viable operation of the system, but they do require innovative thinking and careful institutional design. Ultimately, high-speed rail is both an economic and a lifestyle choice for society. Is this the lifestyle we wish to have as a society, as a country? Can we live without it? Probably. Would we live better with it? Most likely we will. So um, with 
that last slide here uh, from the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Spanish high-speed rail agency. Um, best, you know, it's a pretty fairly cute, uh, I guess, uh, um, <clears throat> ad for, for, for their high-speed rail services. The best way to protect nature is by imitation and um, so they then make the case for uh, energy efficiency. With that, I thank you. And I'd like to introduce uh, our next speaker, um, Professor uh, Chris Barkin uh, from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign is a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and the director of the uh, Railroad uh, Engineering uh, Program um, at the University of Illinois. Um, Professor Barkin uh, is a leading uh, expert nationally and internationally in railroad engineering. He specializes in safety and risk analysis and really in all aspects of rail engineering and operations, uh, both for passengers and, and, and freight, uh, with particular interest in new rail technologies. Prior to joining uh, the University of Illinois, um, um, Chris was the uh, director of um, risk engineering and safety at the American Association of, uh, for Railroads. And uh, he will be talking to us about engineering and operational challenges in high-speed rail. Chris? Well, um Thank you, Hani. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here this evening, and I also want to thank the um, organizers from the Chicago Council on Science and Technology for inviting me to participate in this, and uh, it's really nice to see this such a, a great turnout. Um, as uh, Professor Mon Mamasani said, I'm going to be talking to you about, you know, he's, he's kind of given you the 100,000-foot view, and I think my role is more to give you the 30,000-foot view and look at some engineering and technical challenges, and then the final speaker will talk about what's really happening right here on the ground uh, in the Midwest, and that's, of course, Mike Frankie. Um, what I'm going to cover today uh, is, first, I'll give you a brief introduction to North American freight and passenger transport, and again, a very nice introduction from uh, Professor Mamatsani about kind of setting up why some of these things are particularly important here in, in, in the United States. I'll talk a little bit about kind of the contrasting approaches to developing high-speed rail, incremental versus dedicated and shared corridors. Uh, and then um, conclude by discussing some, just kind of an introduction to the engineering operational and institutional challenges for high-speed rail in the United States. Well, first of all, let's, you know, really uh, understand just how much freight we move in this country. And I think it's a little known fact uh, outside the railroad industry that North America has the most efficient, most effective, most productive freight railroad system in the world. And every one of us benefits from that as a result of the reduced impact on the environment, the improvements it has on our economy, on safety. All these things are beneficial to us um, because so much freight is moving on the rails as opposed to on the highways, where, where a lot of it is in Europe, as, again, as, uh, as Hani mentioned. This is a pair of maps contrasting our railroad freight traffic density on the left with um, the Amtrak passenger routes on the right. And it, what should be immediately evident is it's a much denser network on the freight, and those different colored lines indicate different levels of traffic on those lines, but the big heavy red ones are 100 million gross tons or more. And let me tell you, that's a very busy railroad line. And uh, the ones, the next ones below 60 to, to, to 100 are also quite busy. And so you see a lot of busy rail lines all across North America. Contrast that with, of course, the, um, the uh, Amtrak passenger routes, most of which outside the Northeast Corridor only have uh, one or a few trains a day. There's a few exceptions, but by and large, that's typical of those long distance routes. So uh, the point is that we're really making use of this railroad network, but we're using it to move freight, uh, not passengers. This is the same uh, graphic that, um, that, that Hani showed. Uh, I just want to make one observation, which is, uh, very pertinent to the presentation I'm giving you, which is, is that, that that Midwest region um, where we, we're all sitting in the middle of, the hub of that in Chicago, that's going to be what we call incremental and shared corridor operation. It's not going to be these uh, new uh, dedicated lines. And that really is, goes to the heart of what, um, uh, what we're going to be talking about this evening in my presentation and I suspect in some of Mike's as well. 
All right, well, let me introduce a little bit more about these, what I consider, two key decisions in high-speed rail development. And they're related, but they're not identical. First of all, what approach would you use to develop high-speed rail? Is it going to be an incremental upgrade of an existing line, or is it going to be a brand new uh, dedicated line, such as those core expresses that, that Hani referred to? The second question is, will existing rights-of-way um, be used, and if so, how? And the FRA has three designations, shared track, shared right-of-way, and shared corridor. And each of these, um, both the, the first and the second, the, uh, uh, have significant implications in terms of speed, performance, cost, operational, institutional, and regulatory considerations. <clears throat> so here's a graphic that shows you something about the types, the way we share track in the, in the rail world, or I should say share infrastructure. Um, the upper graphic is showing you uh, shared track and shared right-of-way, and basically it boils down to how close the tracks are to one another. And uh, the consideration is, is that if the adjacent track centers are less than 25 feet apart, that falls into the shared uh, right-of-way consideration or category. And if the trains actually share the different tracks, and there's, in other words, the freight train might move onto the passenger train's track and vice versa, then that's a shared trackage. The lower graphic is showing a shared corridor, and that's when the um, tracks are separated by a minimum of 25 feet and up to 200 feet uh, of separation. And that's um, what we would call shared corridors and would be much more typical of what we would express, expect in one of these core express uh, lines. But the point is, here in the Midwest, we're talking about the upper graphic, not the lower graphic. Shared track and, and shared right, primarily shared track. So what I'm showing you here is a hypothetical line, or we might have an existing rail line, and we can make some decisions about whether we want to incrementally upgrade it, whether we want to use some kind of a hybrid approach, which I'm not going to be talking about tonight in the interest of time, or a dedicated high-speed line. So constraints to high-speed operation on existing lines, uh, and there are, this is a, not a comprehensive list, but this is some of the major ones. Uh, first of all, the tangent, which means the straight sections are not long enough to attain maximum speed. Um, even if they are long enough, uh, you may have curves that restrict speed. Uh, the current track quality and the geometry are unsuitable for high-speed operation. There are often many grade crossings. Uh, the signal spacing and traffic control system are incompatible with high-speed operation. Um, there may be a regulatory limit on maximum speed. With, well, there is a regulatory limit on maximum speed without in-cab signaling. That's why all these trains never go more than 79 miles per hour, because the FRA says you can't unless you have a signal actually in the cab telling the, the locomotive engineer what the, um, the condition of the block ahead would be. Uh, the rolling stock is not presently suitable for high-speed operation. and if we were to consider electrified operation, we don't have the electric power distribution infrastructure in place. So those are just some of the challenges to, 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 to overcome. So if we were to approach an incremental upgrade, and this is exactly what the state of Illinois, uh, working with uh, the FRA and Amtrak and the Union Pacific are doing between here and St. Louis, um, they're doing a lot of these things, um, if not all of them. First of all, curve straightening. Uh, if we, we can establish longer uh, tangent session sections and increase the curve radius to allow higher speed. We can modify the uh, signal system and uh, basically allow the trains to operate faster and still maintain safety. Um, we'll either add protection or eliminate grade crossings. And uh, we may, we certainly are going to need some kind of trains that can operate at a faster speed, and that's one of the things that uh, IDOT is in the process of obtaining. Um, and this approach, this incremental approach, is what's going to be used on the majority of the initial U.S. high-speed line upgrades. Again, as, as Hani mentioned, it's only in the Northeast Corridor and in California. Uh, we, it was going to happen in Florida, but they changed their mind. Um, uh, so everybody else in the United States is going to be doing the incremental approach. And the point of this is, is that it's a modest but a relatively quick improvement in service and performance, and it has lower initial cost. But the associated performance improvement is also limited. And I should say that, you know, a point of pride for us in Illinois is that IDOT really is the leading the way in this, in this, um, in, in, in moving forward with this. Uh, they were the ones that had a shovel-ready project, and uh, over a year ago now, Union Pacific got to work rebuilding the track on the line between Chicago and St. Louis. Um, now, the other end of the spectrum is what we would call a dedicated line where those core expresses that Hani referred to would um, be operating. These involve completely new infrastructure and trains. Uh, the, um, 
the system, the train and the infrastructure can be optimized for each other for very high speed operation. They might share right away, uh, but not infrastructure, and, and this would only be in certain urban areas where uh, speeds would be lower due to urban, uh, curves or other constraints. But the point is, is the majority of the line would be a brand new railroad. This certainly offers the best overall performance. Uh, it has uh, lower operating costs, uh, may be possible because of the greater efficiency of this very uh, uh, well-designed railroad. Um, but it's not surprisingly the most expensive. It may be politically difficult because you're condemning property and potentially time-consuming acquisition of land for the right-of-way. So I should have said in the previous slide, um, this is the approach that, again, we're saying playing in the United States, and it's also been much of the approach that Sweden has taken with development of their high-speed rail. Really the only two countries in the world that I'm aware of that have practiced a pure dedicated line approach is um, Japan and Taiwan. Everybody else has pursued something that's sort of in between these two. Uh, again, the French example is a superb one. All right, let's get back to freight. Um, and in the rail industry, we talk, you've been introduced to the acronym HSR, but I'm going to introduce a new one, and it's called HAL, H-A-L, and we're not talking about the computer in 2001 or whatever it was, a space odyssey. Um, we're talking about heavy axle loads, and uh, they're very well illustrated by that train on the left. That is an incredibly efficient freight train. That train is moving perhaps 10,000 or more tons of coal. Um, in very small uh, consumption of energy to move that coal. And uh, whatever product we want to move, they're doing it with great efficiency. And one of the keys to that efficiency is the very high axle loads. Uh, the, uh, the weight on the four axles on these cars ranges in North America from 33 to 39 tons. And I can tell you that's much higher than most of the rest of the world. Uh, certainly not in Europe or Asia are they running axle loads anywhere near that heavy. And that greater capacity of those cars for a variety of physical and engineering reasons gives them much greater efficiency um, and, and is an essential element to this very good uh, efficiency of our freight system. Um, on the right we have a, a Chinese high-speed train and uh, the question is uh, can we, how much can we operate these high-speed trains on freight trackage and vice versa? And the answer is uh, we have some significant constraints, and that's part of what we, we as engineers are here to, to address. Now, this is a graphic that I came up with about a year ago after um, sitting through uh, a high-speed rail class that's being taught at our um, university by a visiting professor from National Taiwan University who was actually the vice president of engineering for the Taiwan high-speed rail system. And he's been working on the, the problem of high-speed passenger trains for 20 years, and I've been working on freight trains for the last 20 years, and so the minds kind of met here. And um, what we have is on the x-axis, maximum axle load in tons, and on the, y, the vertical axis, we have maximum speed in miles per hour. And this is sort of a historical graph, except I don't have actual dates for a lot of these things, but the point is, is that for the first 100 years of our existence, our axle loads and our speeds of our two different systems were largely the same. You know, they increased as the rail industry became more and more productive. But what you can see started to happen is they started to diverge. And I'd like to populate this with more data, but I'm very confident that this is correct. Because let's look over at the extreme on the right-hand side. That's our current freight cars with axle loads almost 40 tons, operating at a maximum speed of about 70 miles an hour. Then you look at the upper left-hand corner of this graphic, and what you have is the N700. That's one of the Japanese, uh, latest Japanese Shinkansen trains. and the, TGV POS is one of the French trains, and those trains are running in the 200 mile an hour plus range, and, um, and their axle loads are considerably lighter, especially the Japanese. In fact, what, what inspired this graphic was sitting in class and realizing that an entire rail car of the Japanese Shinkansen weighs about the same as one axle in a US freight car. <laughs> the point is that these cars are four times heavier um, then, and, and so if you think about the consequences of running trains at these different speeds and these different axle loads and their impact on the infrastructure and their impact on the vehicles themselves, they're, uh, they're profound. What I also realized from this was that what we've done, we started doing probably 50 years ago when the Japanese opened the first, um, or began the first um, high-speed rail line, the Tokaido line, is we've been optimizing two different types of railroads. We look out there, we see two rails four feet eight and a half inches apart on ties and it looks the same, right? 
but it's about where the similarities end. High-speed trains now have evolved to a high, fine engineering art, as have heavy axle load freight trains. And they've done it by specializing their, their infrastructure, their technology, everything about them to match the needs of that particular set of operating conditions. And you can see how widely divergent they have become. So our challenge in North America is basically, I'll see if I can make the pointer work, figuring out how far can we go up in this area and still use the same infrastructure. At some point, they diverge, and it's Im impossible to, to mix them up. But, but we can probably move this up a little bit more and still have compatibility. All right, again, I'm only going to introduce these topics, and this is not by no means a comprehensive list of topics, but these are some uh, that I selected to, to discuss tonight. And um, infrastructure designs, safety, service quality and capacity, rolling stock, and risk management are all elements uh, that we uh, are, are concerned with in this. So infrastructure, first of all, obviously with those heavy axle loads and those high speeds, those high speed trains have very tight, precise requirements regarding the track uh, uh, track condition, the track geometry, and um, the freight trains, let's face it, they're, they're hitting them with very heavy loads, and so it's, it's hard to keep them in that, in, within those very tight tolerances needed for the high-speed trains. So the, the question is, you know, what kind of design we can use, and what we're mostly familiar with in the United States is this, you know, the familiar Kong, uh, tie or sleeper and rails, but in Really, most of the rest, most of the new high-speed rail systems being built in the world are using something called slab track, um, which is basically a concrete slab with rails affixed to it. Um, we don't know yet whether we can adapt slab track to successful use for, for freight trains. That's one of the questions. Um, track geometry refers to the curves and the alignment and the gauge and what we call the cross level, the different heights of the rail. Uh, and the point is the requirements for these differ for passenger versus freight. Um, basically, as you, again, are familiar with when you drive your automobiles on a highway, you have a banked curve to, to counterbalance some of the centripetal forces. And um, a high-speed train wants a heavily banked curve, but a slower, heavier freight train going around that same curve is putting ex excessive loads on the lower rail because it's not balanced. It's not in balance with the, curva the, uh, the super elevation of that curvature. This is a major constraint. Uh, and challenge to overcome this. And it's been partly overcome in uh, some places by using tilting technology, such as the SL uses on the Northeast Corridor. But that only buys you so many miles per hour, and it certainly doesn't get you up into the 200 miles per hour range and still be compatible with freight trains. Uh, we're all familiar with grade crossing safety, uh, and there are a variety of regulations associated with uh, how grade crossings have to be protected uh, based on uh, the different speeds you want to operate at. Um, and uh, these are prescribed by the FRA, and there are a number of things that are uh, being used um, either here in Illinois or elsewhere, long arm gates, medium barriers, uh, four quadrant gates, or incursion detection. And of course, the best thing to do is to close a grade crossing altogether or make a bridge, but closures are inconvenient and unpopular with people who have to drive farther to get across the tracks. Bridges are very expensive, and even if you can afford the bridge, it may be disruptive um, to residents or businesses that are on the streets adjacent to the crossing. Um, another factor of safety is adjacent tracks. If you have an accident with a freight train and it, in that it derails and it fouls the passenger track, you may have a collision with that. It may cause a derailment and you may have casualties that you wouldn't ordinarily have had if you didn't have the passenger trains nearby. There's some suggestion and some consideration of use of derailment barriers, but these um, obviously add cost and may create maintenance problems, maintenance access problems as well. This is a really important one for the railroads. Uh, the freight railroads, again, as we have been discussing, are uh, quite important to our economy. And the, uh, the lower chart, is, or lower, lower map, is showing you the red or the congestion points in the railroad freight network. And not surprisingly, there are a lot of the urban areas, including Chicago. And um, these are also, not coincidentally, the same places where Amtrak tends to experience delays. I mean, all this congestion in these urban areas. Well, the problems are most severe in these congested areas, but they experience them out on the, on the road as well. And the point is, because of the different operating characteristics, freight trains tend to run more slowly, passenger trains tend to run faster, obviously do run faster. Uh, they also have priority over the freight trains, um, and also stop and start, because they have to pick up and, 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 set and, and leave passengers. These different characteristics have a disproportionate impact on both the reliability of the rail line 
that, that's sharing the tra traffic as well as the, um, uh, the, the capacity of the line. And so optimizing the infrastructure and the rolling stock and the operation for one freight versus passenger creates problems for the other. This is uh, really an operations research problem that uh, Hani Mamasani is one of the people that's working on this, as he mentioned in his study in Europe, and we're working on this sort of thing as well at University of Illinois. Rolling stock standards, um, we have a different philosophy in, in, in this country. Um, we, we are designing our rolling stock to be more survivable in accidents. Uh, you know, the, 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 the rest of the world's philosophy with regard to high-speed rail accidents is you just can't have them. You just take steps to absolutely prevent accidents. As, uh, as Hani said, this accident in China was the first one of a true high-speed line in the history of high-speed rail. The Japanese have been running since 1964 untold, you know, trillions of passenger miles with not a single fatality. And there's, you name me a transportation mode that can make that claim. Uh, the French have the same claim to make. Uh, it's a phenomenal record, but it a, represents a fundamentally different philosophy with regard to how we build, design, and engineer and operate our systems. We aren't happy to have accidents in this country, but we recognize that they, at least in our current system, sometimes happen, so we have to build our rolling stock to be much heavier and more robust to survive those accidents. And so although these two trains look relatively similar, the upper one is the Acela, the lower one is one of the French TGVs, uh, they are very different in terms of their weight and their mass and their crash resistance. And I'm a little reluctant to say what the French refer to, uh, referred to the Acela when we were getting it built about 15 years ago, but how many people here speak French? So tell us what la couchon means. <laughs> it's the pig. Um, and that's what they referred to the Acela because it was so heavy, it can't go as fast as their train. And you know, they have these light, nimble trains that, but because of this extra crash worthiness that had to be built in because of our regulatory structure, uh, that, that was essential. Um, related to that, of course, is that um, if you have accidents, well, we obviously we, nobody wants to have accidents, we do everything we can to prevent them, but they do sometimes happen. And if you derail a train load of coal, well, the coal doesn't complain too much. But if you derail a train load of passengers, you may injure or even kill them. Uh, besides, the tragedy of this event is obviously significant financial consequences. Uh, and so freight railroads would frankly prefer not to have this extra liability on their property. So um, we're faced with. Um, so, so my kind of my closing point here is, is that I, I wanted to say that a lot of people look around the world and say, well, we've got high-speed rail in 20-plus countries now. Why don't we just buy this technology and put it down in the United States? Well, the answer is it's not that simple because there's a whole host of circumstances in the United States that don't exist in other parts of the world. One of the points I forgot to make when I was talking about heavy axle loads and high-speed rail is what we are trying to do in this country is unique in the world. Again, almost 50 years of high-speed rail experience in the world, in Japan, starting in Japan and later in France, but they are not doing what we're trying to do. They're not trying to run high speed and heavy axle load efficient freight systems like we are. That's a significant, uh, again, technological, engineering, and operational challenge. And um, so what I've been talking about this evening is just an introduction to a few of these points. Um, but they refer to, again, infrastructure, safety, service quality and capacity, rolling stock, risk management, and a number of others that I haven't mentioned tonight. Um, the point is the variety of different challenges are going to require solutions. That's what engineers are here for, is to develop those solutions. I believe we can solve these problems, but it's not going to happen overnight, and it's going to require flexibility and uh, multiple types of solutions depending upon the circumstances. And with that, I'll uh, say thank you very much again for inviting me. And And I forgot one very important thing, which I meant to say right at the beginning, which is, is that uh, I was substantially aided in this presentation by uh, my graduate student who's here, Brendan Corrin, and I want to thank him for, for assisting, and as well as um, my colleague, Rapik Sat, and uh, Francesco Bedini, who are also here and working with me on related projects. We have a, a lot of, uh, we're spending a lot of time and having a good time discussing and working on all these pro pro uh, projects together. So my role now is to... Uh, <laughs> Uh, is to introduce our next speaker. And uh, I'm pleased to say that Mike Cranky is um, uh, a friend of mine as well as a, a leader in the railroad industry and has been for the past 40 years. During this time, he's worked for several Class I railroads, those are the big freight railroads, and uh, held various operating and engineering positions of increasing responsibility. Currently, Mr. Franke is Assistant Vice President for State and Commuter Partnerships at Amtrak, and he's also served as the AVP and Program Director of the Midwest Regional Rail Initiative. 
Um, in this role, he's worked closely with the co-sponsors of the initiative, including the FRA and transportation agencies of the Midwestern states. Through his leadership, he's helped foster an enhanced partnership between the states and Amtrak in planning and providing Midwest passenger rail service. Mr. Frankie is regarded by his peers in the industry as an expert on rail issues, and I can say that with complete conviction. I know a lot of his peers, and they have nothing but the highest regard for him. Um, and he's been uh, called upon by congressional and other government leaders for his advice on passenger rail development. Um, he's currently leading a team of employees who are um, conducting feasibility studies to evaluate the potential for additional intercity passenger rail service here in the Midwest. He also serves as the chairman of the TRB High Speed Rail Idea Program uh, for the National Academy of Sciences and uh, uh, serves on the boards of a number of other charitable and professional organizations. And before I ask him to come up here, I'm also going to say that we're very proud to say that he's an alum of our program of the University of Illinois and uh, has been a tremendously important supporter, important supporter of the rebirth of the University of Illinois rail program over the last decade. So, Mike. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chris, and uh, thanks for the invitation to uh, present tonight. I do have a, a little sinus infection, so I uh, hope my voice lights out if, uh, or, or carries on. If not, I have uh, my trusted ally here, Mr. Mark Meglieri. Mark, would you raise your hand? He's our media relations man in Chicago and uh, has a very deep and compelling voice, so he'll take over if I fail. Thank you, sir. <laughs> what I'd like to do is uh, give you a very brief overview of, of Amtrak. A lot of folks don't know why Amtrak exists and, and how it came about. Then look a little bit about the development that is actually ongoing right now, the practical side of what you just heard, and then uh, just touch very briefly on the Northeast Corridor. So are, are we real tight on time or are we still okay? Okay, we'll go here. Amtrak basically has three kind of services. The, the Northeast Corridor, many of you are probably familiar with that with speeds up to 150 miles per hour, basically the territory between Washington and Boston, and actually it now goes uh, all the way down to Richmond with expanded service. Some 153 of the 308 daily Amtrak trains operate on the Northeast Corridor. Another big chunk of service we have is the short distance corridors, generally between 86 miles and 75, uh, 750 miles in length, uh, where the operations are significantly below 110 miles per hour, generally up to 79 miles per hour. Uh, frequencies are generally between one or two round trips a day, can be up to 32 round trips a day. And then also we have 15 states that provide operating support or subsidies for Amtrak services, and six of those are in the greater Midwest. The third bucket of service is the long distance trains. Uh, those are trains that run Chicago to the West Coast, Chicago to the East Coast, or Chicago, Memphis, uh, East Coast down to Florida. Uh, we have 15 of those trains. Most of them are daily. Most of them include sleeping car service because they're overnight trains as well as dining car services. And uh, they're mostly diesel powered with a uh, rare exception in, in a portion of the Northeast Corridor. The role that passenger rail can play, and I think we already heard that from the professors, are that uh, rail is inherently energy efficient, clean, and scalable. The uh, carbon dioxide emissions by mode in the circular graph shows that uh, certainly rail plays a, a very, very uh, low con contribution to the uh, overall uh, CO2 emissions. The other interesting thing is that the modal capacity per meter of width, in other words, the right of way, how many persons per hour can you push through a given width of right-of-way. Uh, for the auto, it's about 200. For the bus, 1,500. Rail goes all the way up to 9,000. So there is also a, a utilization of right-of-way, if you will, that's uh, a very, very important. Let's talk a little bit about Amtrak Midwest operations. Chicago is the hub. It is served by 56 daily Amtrak trains plus several hundred metro trains. The frequency varies uh, out of the Midwest. The highest frequencies we have on any given corridor are seven daily round trips between Chicago and Hiawatha, uh, and, and Milwaukee, it's called the Hiawatha service. Uh, it goes down to a tri-weekly operation between Chicago, Cincinnati, and the East Coast called the Cardinal, but most are daily services. 
The state of Illinois is one of those six states in the Midwest that supports uh, three services. The Lincoln service between Chicago and St. Louis has four corridor daily round trips plus a long distance train. The state of Illinois supports three of those round trips. The next corridor is Chicago Carbondale with two state supported daily round trips. And then we have service out to Quincy with also two daily round trips supported by the state. The recent round of federal funding has uh, made significant opportunities for investment of federal funding in a lot of these corridors. Back in uh, 2006, the number of frequencies on all of those three corridors that Illinois supports were increased. And the graph to the right shows the ridership growth on those corridors. Remember, these are simply frequency increases, no speed increases, no change in service other than the frequencies. We've shown a fairly steady growth. The, uh, uh, you can see the, the light blue, the Chicago-Milwaukee service is uh, approaching 800,000 riders a year, conventional service. The uh, red is the Chicago-St. Louis corridor, very, very steady growth. And of course, the same for the Chicago-Carbondale and uh, then the uh, Chicago-Quincy. They're a little bit more level than the other two, but certainly the the upper two, Chicago, St. Louis, Chicago, Milwaukee, are showing tremendous growth. That was, uh, the, the increase in frequencies was a result of the General Assembly doubling Illinois state support funding back in November of 06. And I think it's, uh, the importance of this message is that you can attract riders with a good level of service, more frequencies. The magic number across the nation seems to be that when the frequencies on a given corridor approach four or five a day, evenly spread, the ridership begins to go up uh, exponentially. One or two, you get a pretty proportionate increase, three frequencies, but the five is the kind of the magic number. And of course, the St. Louis corridor shows that. Other Midwest state partners are Wisconsin. Uh, they have a, the Hiawatha service, as I mentioned, and the state also is, uh, has a service through the Empire Builder, a long distance route. Michigan has two state-supported route and one national network route. The Paramarquette is a service between Grand Rapids and Chicago. Blue Water is between Chicago and Port Huron via Lansing. And then the Wolverine service, which serves Detroit and intermediate cities, is actually a core network line of Amtrak. Uh, it is subject to significant capital investments, and I'll touch on that in just a minute. The Missouri service is also state supported with round trip service between St. Louis and Kansas City. Uh, also two long distance trains serve Missouri, the Texas Eagle and Southwest Chief. The, uh, the difference between a network train and a state supported train is that at the time of Amtrak's creation back in 1971 by a, an act of Congress, uh, at the purpose of which was to relieve the private freight rail industry of the substantial deficits that were being incurred by the passenger network. The, uh, caveat was that the, by giving up these services, the freight railroads were indemnified from liability by Amtrak, and that continues to this day. We also received access rights, so we have access rights to every piece of the U.S. rail network uh, under federal mandate. And then the third item is we get to operate at incremental cost. Those are very, very important uh, factors uh, that date back again to the beginning of Amtrak. So at the time Amtrak was formed in 1971, there was a core network established, and some of these long distance trains were part of that core network. Individual states had the right to add frequencies if they were willing to pay for them, and that's how these, the state supported service program got its beginning. All right, Iowa. Uh, there was a plan to extend some new service that Illinois is proposing between Chicago and Quad Cities onto Iowa City. It appears that that uh, particular project is on hold from, from Quad Cities West. I know Illinois is proceeding full blast with Chicago Quad Cities expansion, uh, so we'll have to see how that one pans out in Iowa, uh, given the political climate. Texas has one very successful state-supported train. Uh, they share equally in the cost of that with Oklahoma. 50-50, and that's the Heartland Flyer running between Fort Worth and Oklahoma City. Also, the uh, Texas area served by the Texas Eagle and by the Sunset Limited train. 
All right, uh, I think the professor earlier showed this uh, graph of the initial uh, plan for the Midwest Regional Rail System. Uh, the use of 3,000 miles of existing freight, rail, and commuter rights-of-way uh, is, is fundamental to that hub-and-spoke system out of Chicago. Uh, the plan is to eventually introduce state-of-the-art train equipment. The, the Midwest recently became the recipient of a very large federal grant for new rolling stock and locomotives and uh, they will obviously have Wi-Fi access, uh, food service, power outlets, all the amenities that people look for nowadays. In addition to the current routes, there are several efforts underway to expand services. I mentioned Quad Cities. Another plan is Dubuque, and I don't know if you're gonna touch on that later or not. Uh, we are actually uh, having uh, additional feasibility studies undertaken right now for some other services in the Midwest. Uh, Peoria is another linkage that may occur at some point. Uh, a second uh, empire builder type service to the Twin Cities is uh, being studied currently. So there's a lot of interest in, uh, in the rail field that continues among all the states. Seven of the eight Midwest uh, regional rail states are included in the national high-speed rail network. All right, let's talk a little bit about current work. On uh, May 9th of 2011, some $2.02 billion was uh, announced as uh, successful grants for 22 projects in 15 states. 404 million of that to expand service in the Midwest uh, and broken down, it's uh, about 186 million to further improve the Chicago-St. Louis corridor. They, they also, Illinois had a previous grant that will raise top speeds on the St. Louis to Dwight segment to 110 miles per hour. The new grant, this 186 million, will uh, make that same improvement from Dwight North to Joliet. Almost 200 million will go to improve the Chicago-Detroit-Pontiac corridor. Uh, the, uh, that goes on top of a grant to acquire a portion of that uh, corridor. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Trains are currently operating at 95 miles per hour on an Amtrak-owned line between Porter, Indiana, and Kalamazoo. Amtrak actually owns a 97-mile segment that is being prepped right now for 110 mile per hour service. It is maintained at 110 mile per hour standards. We expect to turn that service on. Uh, have you heard, Mark, the latest date? Not this month. Not this month, but it's, it's, it's becoming imminent. Uh, we actually ran test trains up there at 110 miles per hour over the last several weeks, but we are consistently running at 95. Uh, the interesting thing is, to the east of that uh, Kalamazoo ownership change, the track is owned by Norfolk Southern. The freight service on that segment between uh, Kalamazoo and Detroit has virtually dried up. The line is for sale. It is deteriorating. And uh, so you have this, uh, this beautiful, pristine 97 miles owned by Amtrak abutting up against a 135-mile uh, line, uh, line segment of Norfolk Southern deteriorating for sale, but which hopefully soon will be bought and, uh, and upgraded as well. The remaining funds uh, are going to Michigan from Minnesota and Missouri for a variety of uh, infrastructure and, and study projects. All right, the Chicago St. Louis Corridor, let me hone in on that. That received uh, 1.14 billion, and it was uh, one of the largest grants uh, in the nation to upgrade the Chicago St. Louis Corridor to 110 miles per hour. That work began last year. There was significant work done this year. Uh, the entire line is being converted from wooden ties to concrete ties. A lot of new road crossing construction, turnouts, uh, signal system upgrades, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the uh, trip time will be decreased by more than an hour between the endpoints once all the work is complete. And uh, this will set another round of investments to permit an eventual increase to eight round trips per day. Uh, currently, as I mentioned, it's a total of five. This shows uh, just a couple snapshots of how some of the track work looks, a aerial view of the Springfield Station, and uh, a, a train at an intermediate point. But the track is now uh, concrete ties pretty much all the way from Dwight to St. Louis. So it's a beautiful, beautiful looking track. It rides, uh, rides better than the Northeast Corridor. All right, the Amtrak Michigan line. This is a real concern. As I mentioned, we own 97 miles of the total of 304. Uh, Michigan is working and does have a federal grant to acquire the, the NS portion of the line. 
and uh, the, the planned and announced federal investment on this corridor between Chicago and, and Detroit is in the neighborhood of $600 million. Uh, since 1990, the state has invested $65 million in equipment and infrastructure. Uh, we have uh, contributed significantly as well, as has the federal government. So we have a huge opportunity here to take a corridor which has very solid ridership. It has a good uh, uh, you know, basic uh, base to start from, a good population density along the way. Uh, we have an opportunity of a lifetime to make this another showcase corridor. The Chicago Porter segment is owned by Norfolk Southern as well. So you have the deteriorating section on the east owned by Norfolk Southern, a, about a 38 to 40 mile segment on the west end owned by Norfolk Southern. Uh, it's like day and night. The Chicago to Porter segment is a very, very heavily trafficked freight route. Uh, there is a federal grant in the pipeline of, of about $71 million to begin capacity enhancements on the Chicago Porter area because we have a lot of issues there with freight passenger interference, freight trains trying to overtake uh, passenger tra uh, freight trains. Uh, it's just a very, very congested area. The Kalamazoo to Dearborn line, as I mentioned, uh, the funding and uh, for the purchase of that is in place. We are having virtually daily conversations with Norfolk Southern, State of Michigan, the federal uh, FRA, Federal Railroad Administration, on that purchase process as well as trying to bring that line up, up, to, up to standards. The plan is for the state to acquire the line and then the state to contract with Amtrak to upgrade the line to operate and dispatch the line as well as to maintain it. Uh, there's also a, a grant in West Detroit. This is a, a fairly simple, low cost project, about $8 million, that takes us uh, around a bypass to a heavily congested freight area. So you, there are some things, some low hanging fruit here that are possible in these corridors to get more reliability and uh, reduce trip times. It doesn't all have to be the three and $400 million projects. Some station improvements uh, are underway or uh, authorized. A new intermodal station in Dearborn is fully funded. A new uh, platform and facilities at Troy. A uh, renovation of the Battle Creek Station is funded and preliminary engineering for a new Ann Arbor station. In Chicago, on the Chicago to uh, Detroit corridor, the Englewood flyover uh, has been fully funded at 133 million and work is getting underway on that as we speak. The Create project mentioned earlier uh, has a tremendous positive benefit on passenger rail. Even though there are 19 projects that benefit Amtrak directly, uh, that means they're directly on an Amtrak route, and 21 projects benefit Metra, where Metra is directly on the route, it is critically important that uh, this be viewed as a network improvement. So even if there are projects off an Amtrak route or off a Metra route, uh, they, uh, they do benefit passenger operations through what I call the ripple effect, the stagnation that occurs, the capacity issues that occur, uh, and they ripple through the entire network, not just on Amtrak or Metro routes themselves. The, uh, the dots that you see in red are those projects that are directly benefiting uh, passenger service. CREATE also supports the larger vision for Midwest Rail. So green is the FRA designated high-speed rail corridor network. The Midwest Rail initiative is in yellow. Current Amtrak's route are in blue. And then red are those high-speed rail corridors that will be benefited by CREATE projects. So you can see it's virtually all of them in, in one way or another, either directly or indirectly. So CREATE is vitally important to a successful Midwest network and eventually high-speed rail. The Englewood flyover, that is a, a bridge, a separation of two rail routes at 63rd and State Streets, south, south side of Chicago. Uh, again, total cost about 133 million. And uh, this, this route uh, has 14 Amtrak trains and 46 NS freight trains on an average per day on the NS route conflicting with 78 Metro Rock Island commuter trains per day. And you can just imagine uh, what this is like in the morning in the rush hour when one Rock Island commuter train after another is trying to get into the city or leaving the city in the evening. The NS corridor on which we operate comes to a virtual halt. So this is a, a very, very good project uh, about, about to get underway. 
All right, let me touch very briefly on the Northeast Corridor. More than half of Amtrak's daily trains uh, and more than 1,800 daily commuter trains traverse the Northeast Corridor, carrying 722,000 riders every day. Uh, Amtrak owns and maintains uh, most of the route miles. Uh, there are 17 tunnels, 1,186 bridges, 14 of them movable, so this is a huge uh, challenge to maintain the, the asset, the asset base, and, and to do replacement. A lot of this uh, infrastructure, especially bridges and tunnels, are quite ancient and require replacement modernization, so those are huge challenges. Uh, top speeds range from 150 for the Excella over a short stretch uh, to 125 generally for the regional trains. And uh, it's interesting to note, we talked about modal share earlier. Uh, we carry more passengers on Amtrak than all the airlines put together between New York and Boston and New York and Washington. So we are clearly the dominant uh, public form of transportation. The key concepts uh, of, of building a higher speed network are that the existing system serve as a foundation for development of everything from segment upgrading to new terminals to existing uh, networks that feed high-speed operations. And most foreign systems, uh, as was touched on earlier, have developed in an incremental fashion. France uh, still uses a lot of the uh, lines, use major terminals, it should be TGV, uh, it's a misspelling there, at, at the endpoints. And speeds were gradually upgraded as technology permitted. Germany did something similar with the ICE trains, the ICE uh, trains, where they would superimpose those on existing networks and then gradually uh, build out and finally go to dedicated rights of way. Here's an interesting example, a, a quick comparison of the Am Amtrak Keystone Corridor between Philadelphia and Harrisburg and the and a corridor in Spain, both about the same length. Uh, the restoration on the corridor in, uh, in Harrisburg to Philadelphia involved improved track signals, 110 mile per hour service. The, the corridor in Spain was constructed a dedicated right of way for 186 mile per hour service, including a very, very long tunnel. Uh, again, going to the Harrisburg corridor, the intermediate stops, there were 10 shared right of way with Norfolk Southern. In the Spanish example, it was one intermediate stop. Trip time improvements, Harrisburg to Philly, trip time was cut from just an hour and 50 to an hour and 35, a 15 minute reduction. The uh, Spanish example cut the trip time from 130 to 55 minutes. Annual ridership is not all that much different in fiscal year 2008, actually is higher on the Harrisburg corridor than it is in Spain. Frequency on the Harrisburg corridor is 14, a daily trains 33 in Spain. The growth on our corridor has been 20% a year on the Spanish corridor, 800% a year. But look at the difference in cost. 145 million Harrisburg to Philly versus almost 6 billion for the Spanish example. So this is again something to keep in mind when we look at economics. There is a demand for the lower speed service. I call it higher speed, higher than 79. Uh, it does draw riders, it draws significant riders. Even conventional service with more frequencies draws significant riders. We have a plan on the Northeast Corridor, a step plan to gradually increase speeds to uh, significantly higher levels than they are today. Uh, the first focus is going to be an increase in Excella capacity. Then we're going to go to 160 mile per hour service south of New York, then Newark to New York City, then the next generation high speed New York City to Philly and then ultimately the next generation high-speed rail uh, you know, way down, down the pike. So there is, there is a master plan that is being worked on uh, as we speak for the Northeast Corridor. Uh, we're interested in opportunities uh, for high-speed rail partnerships. Uh, we're modernizing, continuing to modernize the plant as federal and state funding permit. Uh, we are trying to uh, transform our organization into, into something that is uh, viable in a competitive environment. Uh, traditionally, that hasn't been the case, but the environment is competitive now, and we must adopt to that. And I think that is it. Thank you. As, I'm, as I mentioned earlier, we have two people from IDOT, the Illinois Department of Transportation here. 
uh, Miriam Gutierrez and Todd Popish. I we have planned to have a uh, the speakers come up and uh, answer questions. So I am willing to stay till one two o'clock in the morning. So <laughs> for our speakers, I would invite them up along with uh, Miriam Gutierrez from IDOT. And I'm Harvey Kaler. Um, starting with uh, Chris Bakken, um, I always understood that the degradation of track structure was related to speed and axle load, uh, and that that relationship uh, was an exponential one of speed to the axle loading. Uh, this is a little bit different uh, uh, take, and I was wondering how that would impact your uh, graph showing the, uh, that uh, inverted C curve as opposed to the exponential curve for the uh, axle loads on uh, 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 simply a, as a, uh, showing those two factors, how that would interrelate. Yeah, um, maybe, I, maybe I didn't present the graphic exactly right. Um, all I'm trying to, those are the static loads. There's, there's no dynamics in that. It's just saying, I'm just trying to make the point that what we're asking infrastructure to do is both support very heavy axle loads and increasingly higher train speeds. And, you know, people will sometimes talk about, well, 50 years ago we were running 100 miles an hour and we also had axle loads that are half of what they are today. So, so the point is that the environment has changed. Um, uh, you're right, I mean, I think if we were to look at those as dynamic loads, it would be a different graphic. That's really more of a heuristic graph than an engineering graph, if you will. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, I have a bunch more. Okay. Let's go over here. Uh, hello, my name is Arnold Kassemser and I'm with uh, the Masters of Urban Planning Program at the University of Illinois Chicago. And I have a question regarding the, the next generation of the Excella trains and whether and how that's going to be compliant with the next uh, revision of the FRA high speed rail standard and what is going to be different about the Excella 1 versus Excella 2 and how that's going to result in a higher speed. Uh, I have a very brief uh, answer to that. I may have to defer to Mr. Meglieri. I, I don't deal with the Northeast Corridor at all, so I, I, I don't have an answer to the question, but I can get an answer for you. Okay, Mark, do you have any? I'd like that answer, sir. Okay. <laughs> if, if you will let me have your, uh, your, your name and uh, card, I will get that answer for you. Over there. I know Amtrak experimented with freight several years ago to, in a sense, outweigh its density problems. Has anyone studied the idea of connecting to airports and running high-speed express cargo on the, pa on the passenger trains? That way you keep the high speed and you get extra revenue and you could make more frequency? That was the thought. Yeah, we, if you we study don't, that. We, we don't call it freight. Uh, that's a no-no. <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm just... It's ex express. We did carry express at one time. There were major issues with uh, uh, back loads, one-way trips and, and back hauls and so forth. Uh, there were also significant delays in terminal areas. Chicago became a, uh, a choke point for trying to add freight cars to the back of passenger trains. Uh, I was referring to, like, what's on the airplane, the decontainer, something you can put on an annotated... Uh, by baggage car, high-speed express cargo. Yeah, but the, the problem is our terminals aren't set up for that. That's, that's the issue. Right. Over here. Okay. Will the successful completion of the Midwest high-speed rail network help the Midwest uh, in global competitiveness by freeing airport space for international flights that is now used for uh, regional you're directing that to me, or that's a, that, 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 you have a you have a good point uh, indeed by, by uh, um, relying a little more on on high speed rail services. Some of the shorter haul could could you know give way to um, longer uh, to, to longer range aircraft. So so that, that would buy us a little bit a little bit of uh, of capacity, but not for very long. Uh, 
And yeah, I think we, what you have to understand also, it's depending on the distance, people will choose to go on the airplane rather than to take a train. So it also depends on how far the distance is. So for example, somebody going Chicago to St. Louis, when, if you're going at 110 miles an hour, it would be probably better for the person to take the train just because of current security that you have to go through the airport. You don't have to go through that with the train. And you're comfortable, you're able to walk around. So people will then acknowledge that or will choose to take the train rather than the airplane. Now say if you're going Chicago to Texas, although Amtrak does have the Texas Eagle, a lot of times people are not going to want to take that amount of time when they can just jump on a plane. Okay, a 220 mile an hour, if it ever is upgraded to that level, you could, you could extend the range to say Cleveland, Louisville, Cincinnati. Correct, but if you look at 220, um, the FRA has been very clear in stating if you are going to take a train uh, at a higher speed, anything over 125 miles an hour, it has to be designated passenger only. There can be no road closures or no road crossing, so that means you're gonna to have to acquire property. And say, if you look at the current um, airport expansion, think how long that's been under construction just because of trying to purchase property. So, you know, we are trying to get to 220, but we're doing it slowly. The, uh, the but other, that is a good point. The other factor is we have a very uh, uh, specific environmental laws in this nation that require environmental analyses and so forth that sometimes can take years, especially when you get into a dedicated right-of-way with taking of property and removal of homes and so forth, becomes a very, very uh, a lengthy process. I, I do want to actually extend on something that Professor Mamasani said, though. Talking about France, uh, uh, the, the hub being Paris, and I had the good fortune of visiting uh, France and Paris this, this summer, and I I was truly astounded by how well they've integrated their high-speed train network with their air, you know, Charles de Gaulle Airport's the big airport on the north side of, of, of uh, Paris. You come into the terminal, you walk in, and you go down banks of escalators to, I think it's an eight-track train, an eight -track station or six-track station, and there are TGVs leaving there for every point, every major city in f France. And for the most part, you can get to any city in France in less than three hours from that airport. And so it's exactly what you're saying. People aren't, they, they come in on a plane from, you know, in our case it was Chicago, and you get on a train to wherever you're going in the, in the country of France. It's a completely different concept of, of travel than I think we're generally accustomed to in this country. Over there. Yeah. Uh, I was hoping Dr. Barkin would uh, tell us a little bit about the uh, 220 mile an hour uh, study uh, project that you're starting. Um, it's really just begun, um, we're, um, and it's, it's a preliminary feasibility study, and um, uh, it, in addition to considering Chicago to Champaign, it's really, as, as again, uh, as Hani said, it's looking at that as the first piece in a network that might go on to St. Louis or Indianapolis. Um, it's to look at the, uh, the engineering, uh, preliminary engineering designs, the uh, capital cost, the operating cost, uh, very important ridership estimates, um, uh, financing, how would you finance this, and I'm um, trying to think of the, oh, and uh, the economic impacts. Those are the, the essential elements of this study, and hopefully in a year we'll have more to tell you. Over here. Um, yes, Amtrak currently offers auto train on, I believe, one or two routes. Is this something they do in Europe on high-speed rail, or is it something Amtrak would do if they ever got to high-speed rail? Uh, we, yes, we have auto train service uh, on the East Coast, between uh, just outside of Washington, D.C. and Florida. Uh, we have looked at, uh, one time or another, at various other routes around the country, including something out of Chicago. Uh, there's no current plan to expand that service. At, at this time, uh, they they have auto trains in Europe. They're not on the high speed trains, but there are overnight uh, auto trains where you can take your automobile with you on a train to various destinations. Yes. Is there a question over there? Oh, over here. Okay, here. My name is Madeline. I'm with the Midwest High Speed Rail Association. Um, I was wondering if, in any of your studies, you've looked at. Um, 
the cost of, of, of high-speed rail, particularly in operations or even current Amtrak operations, in comparison to other modes of transportation and specifically their recovery ratios, um, is there a more cost-efficient mode of transportation? Uh, yes. Uh, our our uh, recovery in the Northeast Corridor on the Excellus uh, operating recovery is about 141 uh, percent. Okay. If you add to that real estate and advertising and different things the stations, it rises to uh, about 85 percent. Uh, generally, our operating ratio in Midwest Corridor services is in the 70s, low to mid 70s on the recovery, with the rest being made up by, by other sources. So yes, we, we do look at that. We, uh, in fact, we, uh, we rank very, very well among commuter railroads and via Canada and even foreign nations in our recovery, in our uh, fare box recovery ratio, if you will. And then, um, and maybe the professor from Northwestern can answer this. Do you know how that compares to other modes of transportation, such as uh, roads and highways, which I know receive um, substantial subsidies as well? You know, it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to get a comparison, you know, apples to apples in, in, this, in, in this realm, uh, because uh, there are costs that, you know, that, 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 that are on, on the books and, and can easily be included. Then there are hidden uh, subsidies, if you wish. So it becomes extremely difficult to, to, to navigate that and to use a consistent basis for those comparisons. So I'm, I'm not prepared at this point to, uh, to give you a definitive answer on, on that, but you, you will find a, a whole range of numbers with, uh, in, that, in, in various studies uh, that, that have been done um, in that regard. Yeah, one of the difficulties is the, how, how people capitalize things and how people expense things. And when you look at uh, how things are accounted for in the TGV, for example, it's accounted for somewhat differently. The accounting system is a little different. But it usually boils down to what's capital and what's expense. I mean, one thing that's been done, excuse me, in, 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 in Europe in particular, there's been a separation between the infrastructure owner and then the service provider. And so the service provider is looking then at, at, at operating costs without having to be burdened with, with, with carrying the infrastructure, if you wish, other than infrastructure fees that they may be paying. Now, how, how large those are in terms of uh, recovering the costs will, 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 there's a lot of play in that. And in fact, uh, subsidy will be embedded in the magnitude of, of these kinds of fees. Alexi, is there a question over um, how, how are your, um, uh, what is your perception of Washington's deliberations on the budget going forward uh, in November, Thanksgiving, into January, and how would that affect your business? Well, it's, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you're addressing that to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, hope. it's very disturbing that we can't, uh, seem to get a long-range, consistently funded plan. Uh, a rail network, by its very nature, is a long-term investment, uh, you know, capital-intensive investment uh, uh, need. And so you can't have these, these annual budget battles, and you don't know from year to year if they're going to exist or not exist. Uh, most of the countries that are successful in, in a long-term vision have budgets that transcend political parties, or at least philosophies. So they fund things for 25 years and have a master plan laid, laid out to do that. In this country, we, we go from annual budget to annual budget, and now the battle is even whether uh, you know, the state service ought to continue. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's really tragic given what's going on around the world in, in, with the Washington climate. And we've got to come to grips with that because it puts, uh, it's not good for the employees who are operating the service. It's not good for the states who are paying for a lot of these services. It's not good for the nation overall not to have a, a long-range vision. Whatever the role of rail is, let's establish it and fund it correctly and, and move forward. And that, that simply, that environment doesn't exist. So yeah, I'm, I'm very disturbed by it. Question directed uh, principally to the Amtrak and IDOT uh, representatives. Um, Governor Quinn of Illinois recently signed the Public-Private Partnership Act. What sort of a burden will that impose on the citizens of Illinois uh, in addition to the grants that are already given by the federal government? Well, I think if you compare it to the over... We all subsidize 
transportation in this nation. You subsidize airports, you subsidize highways. If you compare the amount of money that goes into rail, I believe it's maybe 10, 15% of what an airport would get. I think last year, I'm trying, don't quote me on these numbers, please, but I think last year airports was around 43 billion, um, then you went, or highways was 43 billion, then you went down to 20, 15 to 20 for airports, and when you got down to rail, you were looking at $8 billion. So if you look at it in the overall scope of things, we're really not subsidizing railroads the way we should be. And I know a lot of people think about their taxpayer monies and look at what you're doing with this, but if you look at, at the overall aspect, Amtrak has been on this particular corridor, our ridership has more than doubled. People do want to take the train. And even with the younger generation, I, when I've traveled this corridor, I've noticed that the younger generation doesn't really want a car. They want their, you know, they want their iPad, they want their iPhone. They want to be connected to technology and they realize they can't do that in a car. They would prefer to do it on a train. So I, I know it's a big concern within taxpayers, but if you look at it within the overall scope of things, the amount of money that goes to subsidize rail is, minuscule compared to what how you're subsidizing airports and highways. One of the charts that I took out of my presentation <laughs> in the interest of time shows this staggering mountain of subsidy for air and rail, I mean air and highway, and this tiny little barely noticeable line on the bottom for rail. And, uh, I think the concern is that these types of, of decisions are really not made on a consistent basis. Ultimately, each one is handled uh, separately w with, without consistency across the board. One, one good thing that Amtrak as an institution and as a mode of transportation does uh, have the benefit of widespread popular support. When you get down to the grassroots and the communities, the, the mayors, the local chambers and so forth are very, very supportive. And uh, when they rally, as they did back uh, when the General Assembly increased the funding, it's a pretty powerful force. And hopefully, the DC scene will come to some senses and uh, listen to the constituents, because people clearly want better rail service. That's a very clear message. We have, I think we'll take these two. And uh, you've already had an opportunity. Yeah, I've had one. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to take these two people, and I suggest you chat afterwards <laughs> and uh, we'll cut it there because it is indeed getting late. Hello, uh, my name is Maurice Ball. I'm, a, I'm a, an advocate member of the Midwest High Speed Rail Association. Um, I kind of wanted to um, uh, tag on to the, the lady who asked about the, uh, the, uh, the government um, political issues involving passenger rail. So I was, the, the question is, um, what is a, the plan, you know, a plan B, you know, if the government, if, if the politicians decide that they want to halt um, the funding for Amtrak, you know, the momentum for, for that you've been mentioned as far as passenger, uh, you know, passenger rail, you know, um, has increased, ridership has increased, the momentum is there. And, if, and I can just, I can't see that uh, Illinois Amtrak ridership just halting. Like, is there some type of plan or to, to try to keep this going if, if Congress all of a sudden decides to halt uh, funding for, for Amtrak ridership? Thank you. Well, the, the states have no, uh, do not support the long distance services monetarily. Uh, so those, uh, if, if there's insufficient money to operate those, there is no other funding source. In the case of the state services, uh, the state certainly had the latitude, if, if they had the financial wherewithal, uh, to, you know, to fully support those. Uh, the problem you run into is a lot of these uh, major expenses related to operations of a, of a rail carrier relate to terminals, like Chicago Union Station, the shops, the shop complex, which are there to serve both corridor trains as well as long distance trains. As you start peeling away some of the services, the costs don't necessarily go away. You still have to maintain the shop, you still have to maintain the trackage, the station, et cetera. And so effectively, the cost of remaining services per unit will go up. 
and that's something that perhaps the state you know can't can't stomach. So that's 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 the tension that exists. They only pay for a you know a, a proportion of Union Station. Uh, back to technology. Does magnetic levitation play any role in your studies? Uh, we, no, we have not uh, introduced magnetic levitation into any of our studies. Well, I want to thank our speakers. The marvelous.